Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series for the last three months of 2014. We're actually studying the lesson number seven in that series for November 15 of 2014. And this particular series is on the book of James. And this lesson is entitled, Taming the Tongue. Now there's a challenge for you. Think we can actually do that? Well, we'll see what the lesson has to say and you can decide at the end whether you think that's possible. But before we get going, we hope that you have your Bible handy. As you know, we always look at a lot of Bible texts. And if you do have your Bible handy, let's have a word of prayer to get us started. Our kind and wonderful Father, you know the challenges which we face as human beings, the foibles which tend to cause us to fail in one way or another. And now as we discuss the issue of tongues and speech and ideas and how we might control those things, give us insight, give us wisdom that we may do what you want us to do and represent you in the best way we can is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, of course, the obvious question to start out with is, what's the relationship between our words, which are produced by our tongues and the rest of our vocal apparatus, and our characters, and our faith, which we would define as our relationship with God? So what's the relationship between words, tongues, characters, and God? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I well, don't think Solomon, that's the right answer. Solomon said that the tongue is the hardest thing to control. Yeah. So well, not only wouldn't Solomon. that wouldn't that um, tell you that no matter what character you have, no matter what you thought, your tongue might run away from you? Well, it's obviously true often. The question is, does it have to be true? Does it have to be true? Mm hmm Well, it's just like it's just like do you have to get mad? But are that's, you going to get mad? That's the question. <laughs> In one sense, it's all interlinked. Yes. yes. It's separate entities, but they're all very definitely connected. And that's what makes the difference. And, and we know that words can be very powerful. I mean, we can all think of great speeches. I mean, think, I think of the Gettysburg Address of Abraham Lincoln and other things like this. The great speeches that were given at critical times and have moved people. John Kennedy's several speeches that he made. Um, one of the things we sometimes forget is that young children are like sponges around words. I have observed, I, I work with in an underserved clinic uh, as a physician, and I have observed adults using swear words, which obviously they wouldn't, shouldn't be doing, and a two-year-old or three-year-old immediately recognizes that there's something unusual about that word and they will just start spitting it out to see what kind of response they're going to get. Think about that then parents the next time you are inclined to say something that is not a good idea. Well, and we know that children are very likely to grow up to be very much like their parents. There was a famous uh, Swedish writer and feminine activist by the name of Frederica Bremer, who apparently was the first one to imply something like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Ellen White had a suggestion for parents and for teachers. And some people think this is a little phony. Tell me what you think. This is, was actually printed first in Review and Herald, March 21, 1882, just uh, a few months after her husband, James White, had died. It's available also on Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 68, paragraph 3. Smile, parents. Smile, teachers. If your heart is sad, let not your face reveal the fact. Can we live like that? Let the sunshine from a loving, grateful heart light up the countenance. Unbend from your iron dignity adapt yourselves to the children's needs and make them love you. You must win their affection if you would impress the religious truth upon their heart. 
all because of a smile? You, if they're afraid of you, or if they don't respect you because of the way you can't control your emotions, etc., your chances of really influencing them are way reduced. But I, I think, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I think when that <coughs> was written, certainly in the higher class people that had money, children were seen and not heard. Yeah. There was a difference. And that's changed tremendously to the point where <laughs> kids get away with anything. Yeah. And that's wrong too. Yeah. Well, words can have an incredible impact on our lives. God's words ought to be the most Im impressive, the most powerful words in every one of our lives. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, I mean, think about it. God creates whole worlds. He created a universe just by speaking. What, what does that tell us about the power of his words? There's an interesting parallel idea to that found in 2 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 6. The Lord who said, out of darkness the light shall shine, so he's talking about what? He's talking about creation, right? Is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts to bring us the knowledge of God's glory shining in the face of Christ. So he says, if I can speak worlds into existence, I can also speak I can also produce help, maybe I wish you put it that way, by working with you in your character. I can create and help you to produce character. Speaking worlds into existence, what kind of physics is that? That's exactly the opposite physics that happens when people explode atomic bombs. Instead of taking matter and turning it into an enormous amount of energy, you take an enormous amount of energy, and only God can do that, and crunch it down and make matter out of it. Yeah, but when they blow bombs, they kind of understand how to unravel things. Are, are they you go. saying God doesn't understand? No, I'm, I'm saying <laughs> the difference between them using tools and microscopes and oscilloscopes versus words. Yeah. And I don't quite understand what words mean when you say, by his word, all these things were. Because you can say that about a general. By his word, yep. the army runs. Well, so, my comment was based on Psalm 33, verse 6, where it says, The Lord created the heavens by his command, the sun, moon, and stars by his spoken word. There's, there's the verse. Okay? And it all depends on what he was to, who he was talking to or what. He, he can do it any way he wants. But it doesn't say there how he did it. No, it didn't say how he did it, no. <laughs> we, if he tried to explain it to us, we wouldn't understand it anyway. Okay. okay. A, a dimension that us yeah. finite beings cannot uh, explain. Well, <coughs> listen to this comment from Ellen White. The largest share of life's annoyances, its heartaches, its irritations, is due to uncontrolled temper. In one moment, by hasty, passionate, careless words, may be wrought evil that a whole lifetime's repentance cannot undo. Oh, the hearts that are broken, the friends estranged, the lives wrecked by the harsh, hasty words of those who might have brought help and healing. Review on Herald, October 31, 1907, also in Messages to Young People, page 135. How many, well, let me ask a, 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 a different question. Do the people who act on TV programs act as if their words really mattered? What do you mean? Well, in a way, yes. Because that's how they make their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And a usually... Lot, a, lot of, a lot of what is said is, is, is deliberate, often practiced. Yes. And uh, it's, it's made to motivate. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, mode to, it, it's made to, to get attention, get more watchers, and make more mm -hmm. money. Yeah, and it's, it's almost the place where the more, most, the more outlandish you make it, the more ridiculous you make it, the more obscene you make it, the more money you make. Well, the more people will watch. Yeah. 
Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word, of course talking about God, Your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Jesus himself said, What gives life is God's spirit. Human power is of no use at all. The words I have spoken to you bring God's life-giving spirit. So, what kind of words are we using every day in our everyday activities? Words that bring life-giving spirit are words that are useless. Is the, is the word, are the words doing this or is it reflecting something else? I mean, it sounds well, like, I, I just don't know how these syllables and, and audio things have any power to do all that stuff you're talking about. Yeah. Well, when it might be, it might be it's just a reflection of something else that we're really talking about. There was some very interesting research done a number of years ago now that demonstrated that you, we, we communicate with lots of our facial expression, our tone of voice, etc., besides the words. And in fact, these groups, I don't know how they did this, but they finally concluded that only 7% of your meaning is, is actually conveyed by the words themselves. So the rest is the emotional tone, the, 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 you know, the expression on the face, etc. And you can learn that. If you want to see that demonstrated, uh, and it happens to me all the time, I, I come up to a child at the clinic and I'll play with them a little bit or something like this, and the child isn't sure whether they should be scared to death or whether they ought to be smiling or whatever, and they immediately turn to mom. If mom is smiling, then they think it's fine. If mom is not smiling, boy, they are, they're out of there. Well, I, th I think, Gary, what you were saying was the mechanical properties uh, of the voice and so on and so forth, and really what is happening there, you're intimating, at least that's what I'm understanding, is it's not necessarily the, the mechanical properties of moving your lips and your tongue and your teeth and everything, it's really what is happening is that they are projecting um, ideas and thoughts uh, that are within, from within the person. Uh, am, I, yeah. am I correct? Is that what you're kind of intimating at there? Well, the, the words are kind of symbols, aren't they? Even, right, yeah. even the expressions on your face are symbols. Right. How mm -hmm. they, I mean, there's animators that can take, you know, a computer face and move them around and you can tell whether they're smiling, whether they're mad, whether, mm -hmm. you know, they're all, they're all telling you that kind of thing. But, but you'd never, uh, probably the tongue it would be the chief instrument there and without the tongue, unless you know sign language and somebody knows sign language, this is a very significant way in which we convey what's inside. So you said the tongue's about 40%? No, I said the, the words, the actual words, if you just put the words on a piece of paper and hand it to somebody, that has about 7% of the total impact. Oh, that explains some boring teachers I've had. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> words are symbols of ideas. Yeah. That surprises me. A lot depends on the choice of words. Yes. You can blow someone out of the water with three or four words if they're well chosen yes. for the occasion there. Or you can take the other way and come in behind it, and they think that you're patting them on the head. Yeah. Well, look at James 3, verse 1. This should be a solemn warning for people like me especially. My brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers. Jay, you hear us? Uh, some Gordon? Some think that. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong profession for me. As you know, we teachers will be judged with greater strictness than others. Why would he say that? Now remember, we, we had our first lesson was all about James. And we, what was James's position? Or have we forgotten? Well, you're talking about in the community and the yeah. Christian <coughs> church. Well, he was leader of the church. That's right. He was, in effect, what we would call the general conference president of the first Christian church. Because he was the leader the first, of the... Kind of the first bishop or... Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The head of the church in Jerusalem. That, yeah, that was his position. It wasn't Peter? No, Peter wasn't. 
Okay. So, um, and the more influence we have, the more lives we touch, the more important it is for us to say and do the right things. And, I mean, I, I don't think this is a, should be surprised to anybody, I'm sure it's no surprise to any of our audience, that it's not really the mechanical movement or a mouth or whatever, it's the emotional content, the ideas that go behind that. So these are just tools here. These are just tools to express what's going on in here. So, um, which is kind of scary because, <laughs> well, what's going on the, in there, Jay? The abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, speaketh. Yeah. I think what it's saying is, what's inside yeah. is is going to come out through that thing, yeah. and uh, and sometimes <laughs> what comes out of mine, I'm. <laughs> I'm not real happy of what it reflects on the inside. I see. It's a testament to what I am, and I'm not happy about that. Okay. Well, how much better would our world be if we all recognize the wisdom of Proverbs 9, verse 10? Remember what it says in Proverbs 9, verse 10? To be wise, you must first have reverence for the Lord. If you know the Holy One, you have understanding. As you look around your world that you live in, how many people demonstrate that kind of wisdom? Not too many. Not too many? Well, what would they have to do to, to demonstrate that kind of wisdom where you'd see it? Well, that, that, that was my question to you. I mean, do you see that around you? I mean, it, it see, if, if we, we who theoretically are aware of what Christianity is supposed to be all about, we should recognize it quicker than someone who has no notion about Christianity, right? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it apparent to the world. So that would be done by, well, I was thinking about getting off an airplane once or saying goodbye to the stewardess. They'd say goodbye, 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 and one guy would go by and say, God bless. And the other one would say, but goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. So is that how you do it? Is it well, things like that? That probably is the start. Might okay. depend some on what that same person had said during the rest of the flight <laughs> and how he'd acted <laughs> and his facial expressions yeah. and whether he yelled and screamed and swore and so on. And we, and, and just, Let's be honest now. Earlier in, in verse 1 we read about the, the challenges of teachers. Look around the world today. The education, especially the higher education that's going on, is it leading people closer to God and a better understanding of God or where is our educational system going? More and more God is excluded, actively excluded. Actively excluded. Wasn't there something on the news the other day where somebody sneezed in the classroom and somebody across the classroom said, God bless? And the just teacher said, just said, teacher, bless you. Or just it, it said, didn't, bless didn't, you. Didn't That's right. God right. just said, bless you. So there. he got expelled yeah. from no school. Talk, yeah. No talking in the classroom was supposedly what the rule was. Uh, at the beginning, they said it was. We're, and the teacher says, we're not going to have any religion in this class. So I, I, think, I think the final yeah. was that it was no talking in the class. Uh, that, that was probably their way of trying to make it sound a little better. Yeah, to tone it down. Well, and, and I know not to get off of the track, but you know the reason why people say bless you or gesundheit or salute, depending on what language you're talking why they say that when people sneeze? Oh, so they're blowing out their s some spirit or something, I don't know. It, it, we, it used to be believed back in the early centuries that your soul lived somewhere up here in the brain, and if you sneeze too hard, you might sneeze out your soul and you'd be dead. So, and the, and, and the response was supposed to be, God bless you, and that's the way, so just in case your soul got out there, it, it, would, it would go back into your brain. And it got to the point where at one point, it, people would say, if, you, if they sneezed and no one responded, they would say, may the Lord protect me until I get to a place where there's some people. Uh, do you think, 
Do you think anybody ever saw somebody die right after they sneezed? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I have. Yes, committed. you could if you had a, a significant cerebral aneurysm. You could sneeze. <laughs> How likely well, is that? Much well, much if you've had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, <laughs> yes. It's historically, possible. historically, the the real time when that was an issue was the black the black plague. Yeah. Hmm. And yes, indeed. Not many educated people. I, I've got a. A bit of a question here, Ken. It is, we've got a whole lesson here on the tongue. Yeah. The use of the tongue and so on and so forth. And I would venture to say most of the time when people think about the book of James and what's in the book of James, they think about this passage and this commentary <laughs> on the tongue and so forth. What in the world ever possessed James to feel he needs to write all of this stuff and include, okay, now we're going to talk about the use of the tongue. What, what is, who is he writing to here that he feels that he needs to bring up this subject and to, to deal with it in this way? Why, okay, I mean, what, what do we Paul know? Paul didn't write about, well, now the use of the tongue and, 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 and because Paul was Elijah writing, and other people here. Paul was writing for a different audience. Paul was writing on, to, addressing people who are outside the church, people who had never heard of Christianity before, most of them, and trying to say, you know, come in. Now, we're going to find that Paul did say quite a bit in here. And this, that we're comparing, you know, James with Paul. He did say quite a bit, especially in writing to, to Timothy and Titus, who he had sent out to establish churches. And he was saying, you know, you're, you're going to be leaders of groups, and this is the kind of thing. But what do we know about the early church? We know that almost the first thing that Acts says about it is there was a squabble between the Greek speaking and the Hebrew speaking or the Aramaic speaking Jews over who's going to take care of the widows. I mean, you know, if you deal with that kind of people all the time, what are you going to say? People, please, you know, that's what James is saying. Please calm down, relax. Let's not be squabbling. I mean, how can we represent the gospel if we're fighting with each other all the time? And if you're a church leader, there you are. Well, I remember back a while ago where um, I would get in an argument with somebody and it was just because I didn't keep my mouth shut when they did something <laughs> and it wasn't <laughs> worth it. I mean, I should have just been quiet about the whole thing and says, oh, this will blow off, forget about it and everything. But, you know, it was just hard to keep from keep yeah. your mouth closed. <laughs> <laughs> and I think well, that happens with everybody. Now, so, so let's, let's look a little bit on the other side. We've just said teachers are going to be under the microscope when it comes to Judgment Day. Think about a teacher or teachers, maybe family members that have had a real influence on you in the past. What was it that gave them that extra punch? Well, they knew what they were doing. They knew what, That's they, what they were talking about. That's a very important point. And I thought they knew what they were doing, mm -hmm. but if they, if they really didn't know what they were doing, I would have been in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's interesting, however, that uh, I know the story of a couple math teachers. One of them was a genius. And you know, you put almost any kind of math problem up there all the way up through calculus, and you get a okay, there you go. And everybody in the class was going, you know. And there was another teacher who was clearly not a genius, but they could, that person could sit up there and carefully, slowly work out these problems, and he would get to the right answer eventually. But by the time he got to the right answer, everybody in the class understood it. So it's not always having the, the, the smartest brain that makes you a good teacher. What, what is it that makes people an influ a good, and of course, which, which of those two teachers do you think was most appreciated? That's why Jesus told parables, mm -hmm. stories that people, uh, common people, or even uh, the whole broad spectrum, people could understand, even maybe the, the leaders could understand, mm -hmm. and it uh, stuck them in their souls, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It was very pointed, and yet uh, people were not afraid of him. No? Except for the leader type, leadership. <laughs> they were afraid of him for a different reason. Yeah, well, they could see it down the road a piece. And I think, I think there, we've all in our lifetime have struck 
good teachers and excellent teachers and one or two here and there we wish we'd never had maybe. <laughs> there is a real talent. Yeah. And I think cert from my own experience, certainly in being able to teach mathematics in a clear way and an interesting way and cut out all the cotton balls that aren't needed. And that is a rarity. Yeah. Yeah, there are definitely people who have skills at teaching. Yeah. No question about it. That understand it. My father used to talk about a, a mutual friend, I mean, someone who was a colleague of his uh, way back and someone that we, we grew up with, the family of that person somewhat. And he said, the, this guy was a surgeon. And he said, you knew he was really good because he could make it look easy. Exactly, yes. You knew he was really good because he could make it look easy. I used to have a teacher at uh, where I teach um, <clears throat> who taught algebra and was known to be able to teach algebra to anybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he which would, is a real skill. <laughs> he would tell his students, um, he said, this can't be hard because it was, if it was hard, I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great, great statement, actually. He said, if it was hard, I wouldn't be able to do it. And he would, well, that's kind of true. If you, you have a teacher that had a hard time getting his algebra mm -hmm. and then they got it, you know, as opposed to a teacher that, was, that got it by doing something else and listening kind of at the side of his mm -hmm. head, you know, as he did it, as he got it. And then you have those two teachers come and teach yeah. a student. Well, the Which one's going to be the best? That's the one I was talking to you about a moment yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. Well, going on to the next verse, he says some absolutely astounding thing in, in the next verse. If a, uh, all of us m often make mistakes, now, which is quite an amazing admission right up there. James, all of us often make mistakes. I'm reading my Good News Bible. But if a person never makes a mistake in what he says, he is perfect and is also able to control his whole being. Is that true? Would you agree that if someone can control their speech, their words, and I would say, to be honest, their emotions, they're able to control their whole being? I, I would say they were a machine. <laughs> <laughs> Machines don't control anything. Well, yeah, but they that's, don't have any that's, that's the thing. A machine doesn't have emotions. You don't have to control the emotions well, but, because they don't have emotions. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who do have emotions, that do have choices, that do have the capacity to say things and don't. And don't? Say I the wrong. I would say they were a machine. Don't say the wrong <laughs> things, at least. Some of that depends on one's background. Okay, yeah. Theoretically, somebody who has had a better chance in life, maybe more education, should be able to do better than somebody who's living on the streets. Doesn't always hold. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. think, I don't know, just from general observation, you could have somebody who is an absolute non-believer, mm -hmm. beautifully spoken and controlled. Yeah. So well, what was the point of him saying that? Well, that's what I'm going to ask you next. What did he mean when he said perfect? What, what is, what's the Greek word perfect mean? Mature. Okay, teleos is the Greek word. And remember, Jesus said what? Be. You are to be like your, well, I mean, the, the different places, but be therefore perfect in the King James, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be ye therefore perfect. What does that mean? <coughs> Perfect means mature, grown up, even ripe if you're talking about fruit. Isn't that where we all should be headed? Are we grown up Christians? Do we exercise our power of choice by not saying wrong things, not losing our temper, and saying appropriate things at the right time? Yes, Jim. Um, verse 2, it says, able to bridle the tongue. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is that word, uh, what is that, is that in cardia, is, is that self-control? Um, hold on just a minute. Part of the fruit Let, of the let's spirit? Let's have a look at that here. Um, 
I need to go back. It is kind of a tongue, whole body also. Kind of a graphic illustration. You think of a horse bridle and mm -hmm. put something in there, and so you can kind of jerk it around as necessary. My new American standard is we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able to bridle. And the word for bridle in this case is, no, it's a different word. Kalinga Gogeo. Kalina, Chalina Gogeo. Oh, of course. And if you want to know what that means, if you have a computer that does what mine does, you click on that and there's the word. Uh, to lead, direct, or govern. That's not a whole lot different. Then. No. Because, I mean, it's yeah, still same uh, idea. Uh, the, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's a little more gentle than maybe. Maybe bridle was a. I think they had gentler bridles back then, but I think of a bridle today is this big old metal thing in the horse's yeah. <clears throat> mouth. Well. well. So now let's let's talk about what this all means. Clearly, he's not just talking about some unruly muscle here that's got uh, maybe, uh, okay, what, what kind of disease would cause you to have a, an uncontrolled tongue? Well, they call that foot and mouth disease. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, anyway. Tourette's syndrome. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Outbursts of yeah. from the tongue, from okay. the mouth. But what we're really talking about are people who control their, can control their appetites, their passions, their desires, even their cravings. Is that possible for human beings, selfish human beings? Now, is that what James is talking about here? Talking about your diet? I thought he was talking about words. I didn't say anything about diet. <laughs> well, I suppose it could include diet. No, appetites, passions. Oh, that's diet. <laughs> no. Okay, skip that word. Desires. Passions, <laughs> desires, and cravings. <laughs> cravings, that's diet. <laughs> it has more to do, uh, there's yes. more than diet involved. Oh, water. Yeah. Well, Jesus said something similar to that in Matthew 12, verse 34. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And you, you, you sort of implied that a little bit earlier. That's a scary thought. So it means if we really want to have the mouth represent God, what do we have to do? Be in touch with what happened in the heart. We need, to, we need to have the mind tuned to God, right? You've got to educate the mind. Yeah. And the verse that we have quoted many times, a passage from Great Controversy, page 555, paragraph 1, it is a law. What, what's a law? It, in scientific terms, when we say a law, what does that mean? Description of fact. It's been tested in so many ways, nobody has yet found an, uh, 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 um, what I want to say, a, a time when it doesn't apply. In and this a, case, uh, it's something that governs yeah. what, what's going to happen. We assume, no one's found an, uh, an exception yet, so we assume it's going to control what's going to happen. So it is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to, to that which is it accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. So, what does that tell us about speech? We should important. speak about good things. Well, and we need to put into our brains only good things, and then only good things will come out. Is that reasonable? There's a, a phrase that's become very common in the computer age, garbage in, garbage out. I was going to talk about that a little bit later, but thank you for bringing it up. What, what happens if we spend all our spare time watching sometime, many times questionable programs on TV, listening to stuff, looking at questionable things on the internet, and then we want to speak only loving, kind, Christian words and thoughts? Is that likely to be a, the case? What, what is it you think you get put into your mind? 
What is it you put in your mind? Yeah, that everything that comes into five senses. I know, but but what is it that's good that gets put into your mind? Oh, reading the Bible. So oh, I take come a, on, that's kind of general. Give me something well, that really I'm, does it. That's very specific. Reading that's, the Bible, prayer, meditation. I think it's I think it's more specific to say God. Oh, that's a yeah, the next part of that. Totally. The next part. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no, I, that's right. I'm not arguing with you, yeah. but I mean, I don't have a chance to grab onto a piece of God. I can take a hold of my Bible. The Bible is what tells us about God. Mm -hmm. It's a story of it's a story of God. What are good secular things to put into your put into your mind? Well, uh, I could give you good lots of examples of that. Um, helping other people. That's secular. What do you call it? Huh? What would you call it? I would say that's reflecting Christ. Well, yeah, that's on a more secular level, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, no, you don't I have don't to. You, you don't have to do. How can you separate that? I mean, call that secular. Well, see, what you're doing is sort of the other side of the coin of Jay. Jay is saying, "Is is anything out there in the world good?" And you're saying, "Any any time something is good, it's it's religious." Uh, not necessarily. No, well, um, that's sort you of what you're saying. The world, uh, the symbol for the world is something that never loves Christ, who there's, never loves yeah. God. There's got to be something that's secular that isn't worldly. Well, well, God created the world, so it's. I think it's the kind of thing like uh, your, your neighbor, eighty-year-old lady who he's got a, a front garden that's going to rack and ruin, or you're a rancher and he's got. 10,000 acres of wheat on and he dies and his wife has got to get the crop off and all the neighbor farmers come in. That's that's kind of secular mm -hmm. assisting people and it's is that, done. Is there, is there good architecture and bad architecture? Is there? You know, yes. Yeah. So, so. Let me, let me give you an example. Okay. You're talking about that. There was a young guy who fell in love with a young lady and the young lady's father was a builder and a fairly wealthy one at that. He'd built a lot of houses and done pretty well for himself. And so he told this young man, he says, you're an upcoming builder. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to give you the equipment and so forth to build a really nice house. And this will be, if you build a really nice house, you can marry my daughter. And so this guy went to work. He thought, well, I'm going to make some money on this house. And he cut a bunch of corners. And we got done with this house. The father said, okay, this is your house now where you will live. Well, but that is, that's, that's the, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, because I'm talking about, is there anything that we, what, what secular thing can we expose ourselves to to make ourselves better? Is there... Well, I, a and I, you say the architecture was the first thing I was trying to, you know, is there some good architecture that will make me better than, you know, I, and it's probably a crazy illustration there, but um, well, I think what, what along similar lines, when you be totally honest with yourself, TV, there's hardly anything on there that's worth anything, but some of the good nature. Except film, us. <laughs> but, but well, yes. But well, what I'm getting at along your line is some of those good quality nature films. I think mm -hmm. they're yeah. worth looking at. Mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some of that kind of thing. There's some absolutely awesome nature films available. Yeah. That many were pr produced by National Geographic. Um, and and, other and I suppose worthy biographies. Yeah. And yeah. 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 And there's biblical stuff. I have at home um, sets of, of, for example, one absolutely fantastic, I think it's three DVDs or something like that, that is nothing but the book of John acted out. And the only words that are spoken are straight from the book of John. I have another series that's the same thing for the book of Matthew. That's a, those are great, great presentations. Um, so. What about from Shakespeare? Anything in Shakespeare? Well, I, let's not go to Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, Shakespeare, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't really mind, but, <laughs> but I maybe I should say I don't know enough about Shakespeare to really be a good judge of that. Maybe it's fair for me to say that. 
more a study on the faults of humanity. Yeah. Well, look at some of the advice given in Scripture regarding how parents should instruct their children. And I want to read two passages. One is more, more familiar, much more familiar than the other one. But I want you to think about these. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. Start just a couple verses before that. Okay. Four. Israel, remember this. The Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Never forget these commands that I'm giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you are at home and when you are away, when you are resting and when you are working. Okay? Now I would like you to take you, the, take you to the other one from Deuteronomy that's not nearly so well known. I want you to think of the implications of this. Okay? Notice that this says, in, in my little heading in my Bible is, Instructions Concerning a King. Now remember, Moses had told them very clearly who was supposed to be the ruler for the children of Israel? He was. God. God was supposed to be their ruler. They did not need a king. They should never ask for a king. It was not the right thing to do. But God, God knew it was coming. So he said these words. And I, I want you to think how different the story of Israel might have been if they had followed this advice. After you have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is going to give you and have settled there, then you will decide you need a king like all the nations around you. Now there's the first mistake. Okay? Make sure that the man you choose to be a king is the one whom the Lord has chosen. Now there's some good advice. He must be one of your own people. Do not make a foreigner your king. The king is not to have a large number of horses for his army, and he is not to send people to Egypt to buy horses, because the Lord has said that his people are never to return there. And then look at this. Why not horses? Because horses were basically used for war oh, offensive and weapon. power. Yeah. It would be kind of like buying a bunch of tanks and airplanes, military planes as a war today. And look at number 17 going on. Think about the kings who came up a little while later. The king is not to have many wives because this would turn him away from the Lord. And he is not to make himself rich with silver and gold. Guess who did that? When he, became ki when he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years, and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. Not like Saul, huh? Well, what about Solomon? Even some aspects of David. I mean, just imagine, I mean, especially Solomon, I think about, just imagine how things would have been different if every Israelite king had done this. Would these words have had a powerful effect? Thing, the thing that amazes me, here we're talking about straightening out our lives, and I'm not against it, don't misunderstand me, but when you think of some of the stuff that David got up to, mm -hmm. it's almost nobody had as much blood on his hands as he had, and we're worried about lining ourselves up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? God says David's a man after his own heart. Yeah. It, it well, makes you think if you, a little bit. I, if I you go pondered that. But if you go back and look at that statement, it turns out the time when he said, David is a man after my own heart, was the time when he was still a shepherd. And it was God exercising his prerogative of choosing. Yeah. Yeah. There's other parallels from other, when, the, when a king chose his vassal, that, that, that phrase, a man of his own heart, means of his own choosing. That's another way yeah. to look at it. Yeah. So you, you became not after his own heart after a while? Well, do you, think, do you think David was following God's heart when he committed adultery with Bathsheba? Well, it depends what he well, meant by heart. Yeah. I mean, you're assuming perfection. I'm here. not assuming anything. I'm just uh. I, I think it's a safe, safe statement that he was not following after God's heart. 
the heart of a man is where he does his thinking, and, and you make your choices in your brain, so yeah. the frontal part of your... Well, we need to go on because we've got a few more verses to cover. Look at James 3, verse 3 to 5. We put a bit into the mouth of a horse, we've talked about that a little already, to make it obey us, and we are able to make it go wherever we want. Or think of a ship, big as it is and driven by such strong winds, it can be steered by a very small rudder, and it goes wherever the pilot wants it to go. So it is with the tongue, small as it is, it can boast about great things. Just think how large a force can be set on fire by a tiny flame. Now what's James trying to say? Small things can have a big effect. Small things can have a huge effect. And he's not the first one who said that. You go back to Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer quietens anger. My British version you can see here. But a harsh one stirs it up. Okay? And another place, uh, Luke 9, 51 to 56 is a very interesting one. As the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind and set out on his way to Jerusalem. Now this is the this is the words that describe the last six months of Jesus' life. He's sort of wandering back and forth and back and forth and gaining more and more influence and so forth. And then he's finally going to make that final trip to Jerusalem with hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people sort of going with him saying, this is our chance, here's our leader, we're going to make him king. And of course we know what, what happened. So he's working toward Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him who went into a village in Samaria to get everything ready for him. But the people there would not receive him because it was clear that he was on his way to Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? And why do you suppose they said that? Just like Elijah. Well, it turns out the, this area of Samaria is almost exactly the same place where Elijah had done exactly that, called fire down on those people who'd been sent out by the king to, to arrest him and destroy him. And so they were, I'm sure they were thinking about, they probably walking along, well, here's the hill where Elijah was when that happened, and then, bang, they're turned away. And what does God, what did Jesus say to them? Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then Jesus and his disciples went away, went on to another village. How often, when we feel we are slighted, do we respond like that? So what does it mean, Jesus turned and rebuked them? He told, what do you think he said? He, he said, that's not the spirit we're made of. That's not what we're supposed to be doing here. And to illustrate that, I have two more quotations from Ellen White. The first one is from the Review and Herald, uh, May 26, 1904. Um, a very incredible statement. Through the help that Christ can give, we shall be able to learn to bridle the tongue. Okay, you want to know if this is possible? Sorely as he was tried on the point of hasty and angry speech, he never once sinned with his lips. With patient calmness, he met the sneers, the taunts, and the ridicule of his fellow workers at the carpenter's bench. I suppose that was James and Judah and his brothers. Who, who was working alongside him at the carpenter's bench? Instead, by retorting angrily, he would begin, instead of retorting angrily, he would begin to sing one of David's beautiful psalms, and his companions, before realizing what they were doing, would unite with him in the hymn. What a transformation would be wrought in this world if men and women today would follow Christ's example in the use of words. Wow. What an incredible solution to a difficult problem, right? Do we recognize the impact of little things? Ellen White elsewhere says that, I may know him, page 209, as drops of water make the river, so little things make up life. Life is a river, peaceful, calm, and enjoyable, or it is a troubled river always casting up mire and dirt. So, it's always better to avoid saying the wrong thing instead of having to try to, you know, correct your words after you say them. I mean, this is illustrated all the time, even on, on the public news, all the time. 
So what happens if we do say the wrong thing sometimes, even unintentionally? What should, what, what should we do next? At least apologize. Okay, apologize. Well, James's next verse says this, and the tongue is like a fire. It is a world of wrong occupying its place in our bodies and spreading evil through our whole being. It sets on fire the entire course of our existence with the fire that comes to it from hell itself. Boy, he doesn't, he doesn't spare any words there. Yikes. How much of this is a treatise on uh, how you should um, govern your life and be a much better person as compared to a treatise as to, you know, really what we face with not only our tongue but ourselves? A treatise on, you know, you're a human being and you're afflicted with this humanity here. <laughs> afflicted with it, huh? Well, how did troubles begin in the very, the first kind of trouble that was known in the entire universe? How did it start? Words, <coughs> insinuation of words. Words. Ellen White says, Lucifer began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37. And how did he cause problems here on this earth? Words. Did God say yeah. words? Well, if we find that we have something, if we've said something inappropriate, or if we have been mis misunderstood, or if, if we have, in actual fact, said something completely wrong by mistake, we should hasten to correct it as soon as we understand the problem. An example from the Bible, it's a very clear example, is the story of Nathan with David. He, David says, I have collected all this stuff and I want to build a temple for the Lord. And what happened the next day? Nathan said, that, that's a wonderful idea, why don't you do it? And the next day he had to come back and said, no, that's not what God has in mind. Look at 2 Samuel 7, I'm not gonna, we don't have time to read it right now, but 2 Samuel 7, the first 17 verses. You'll see the story of Nathan. Well, James concludes in chapter 3, verse 8, but no one has ever been able to tame the tongue. See there? Just what I said. <laughs> it is evil and uncontrollable, full of deadly poison. Is that true? We Look at verse 9. We use it to give thanks to our Lord and Father and also to curse other people who are created in the likeness of God. Must be true, it says it right there. Yeah, in the Bible. Right? Of course, there are, there are lies in the Bible too, aren't there? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> James is lying here. Yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that at all. But David said, going back to Psalm 34 in response, then hold back from speaking evil from telling lies. Turn away from the evil and do good. Strive for peace with all your heart. So he seemed to think it was possible. Hold back from speaking evil. Well, Paul seemed to think so too, Ephesians 4, 29 to 32, with the Holy Spirit's help. We don't have time to go back and read all those verses. But we will read the rest of this passage from James. Start with verse 10. Words of thanksgiving and cursing pour out from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, this should not happen. No spring of water pours out sweet water and bitter water from the same opening. A fig tree, my brothers and sisters, cannot bear olives. A grapevine cannot bear figs. Nor can a salty spring produce sweet water. I mean, how can you argue with that? So how are we supposed to apply the, the, uh, those words? And I, I will, is it safe? Here's the question I think we need to, we need to come to. Is it safe to watch television programs full of profanity, drugs, killing, and sex? Does it add to or detract from our interest in reading scripture? Parents and teachers, do we set the right example before our children, not only by what we say, but also by what we listen to and, excuse me, and watch? Do we like to repeat off-color jokes that we pick up from the media? James made it very clear that springs of water are not at one time pure and a little later contaminated and then pure again. At this time in history, we must make every possible effort to keep the springs of our faith 
as pure as possible. However, to be honest, we must recognize that even the best of biblical examples had their weak moments. Moses was a murderer. He killed the Egyptian. David had that affair with Bathsheba. If those events were all that we knew about those men, wouldn't we have serious questions about their relationship with God? And yet, we know what about them? Moses was called a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. And we know, 1 John 2, 1, that God makes provisions for people who make mistakes. But his goal is, and we read the rest of the verse, is that we stop sinning. That's what he wants us to do. But even if we repent and are frequently and generously forgiven by God, we still have to live with the consequences of our behavior. So what should we do with all our what should we do about our words on a day-by-day -day basis? When in the company of those who indulge, and I'm reading from Ellen White, when in the company of those who indulge in foolish talk, it is our duty to change the subject of conversation if possible. By the help of the grace of God, we should quietly drop words or introduce a subject that will turn the conversation into a profitable channel. Far more than we do, we need to speak of the precious chapters in our experience. We should speak of the mercy and the loving kindness of God, of the matchless depths of the Savior's love. Our words should be words of praise and thanksgiving. If the mind and heart are full of the love of God, this will be revealed in the conversation. And what we talked about a little earlier, gigo, what does it mean, Jay? Garbage in, garbage out, right? Great thoughts, noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, unselfish purposes, yearnings for piety and holiness will bear fruit in words that reveal the character of the heart treasure. When Christ is thus revealed in our speech, it will have power in winning souls to him. Unfortunately, when we're we get riled up and our, our words are full of emotion. They often, rep they often do things which we really wish they couldn't. But there are times when pretty serious words have to be spoken. And the example I would give is the example of Jesus with the Sanhedrin in, in John 8. But I think in summary, we should remember our word gigo again. Uh, if we're filling our minds full of garbage, then when we open our mouths, the garbage is going to come out. We shouldn't let that happen to us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege to present your word before so many people around the world. May it bless them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.